Welcome back to Superhero Stuff You Should Know. We took a couple weeks off for the holiday, but we are back, and this is Uncle Ben with me as per usual. Andrew Spidey Goosh Bush. Shooting out that Spidey Goosh for us. I just love the, you know, puberty metaphor that <laughs> Spider-Man... I keep shooting these webs. <laughs> I can't stop. It's, it's going to be more overt in one of the other ones. Not today's, but another one that we're going to go over. Cameron didn't <laughs> want to focus on that. Uh, he did, but maybe not in the one we're going over today. Okay. But, uh, coming up on the week of this release, actually, is Avatar, The Way of Water from James Cameron. Also, this it just occurred to me, this year is the 20th anniversary of the first Spider-Man movie. God damn, we're old. So 20 uh, years since that shit? 2002. 2002 oh so yeah. yeah i was a senior yeah. in high school man I know, man. so <laughs> we thought it would be a good time for us to cover the time that james cameron almost made a spider-man movie our uh, favorite canadian yeah. <laughs> a lot of you have requested coverage of this and we hinted that we were going to do it last year when zach was with us and had us go over the unused spider-man suit concept art uh we got a lot of requests actually for covering the whole unmade spider-man period of time we've obviously covered the 10 years it took for batman 89 to get off the ground i feel like we're still covering that because more and more more stuff comes out of the woodwork but uh we actually got a great email from earlier this year from a fan named tyler uh who said quote i know you are all mainly about batman and are having a blast right now doing these deep character dives just before the new movie i love them too but I would love to see an episode about the unmade Spider-Man movies. I read James Cameron's treatment over 10 years ago, but I've never read the Dr. Octopus okie dokie script treatment. You'll find out what we mean by that, <laughs> that everyone mentions and was wondering why Cameron would have had two radically different treatments at the same time. I think you guys would do an awesome job clearing up what that whole deal was. Well, Tyler took me 10 months to get back to you, but <laughs> here we are <laughs> on that <laughs> and, well, it takes time to get around man yes, you know especially with this because uh we talked about okay it took 10 years to get batman 89 off the ground dude first spider-man movie took 17 years to get off the ground so we got I plenty mean, of episodes <laughs> it came at a good time though because cg was just getting good enough and all that yeah. jazz and i mean can you imagine the mcu existing anytime like even 10 years earlier than it is now true yeah it's just wild you know it's just everything's coinciding at the, the right time especially yeah so mm -hmm. uh we could have gotten this way earlier if uh the people who had the rights had their way we're not going to be able to cover the full history in this one episode 17 years i mean again it's we've been doing this for a few years and we're still covering the batman 89 stuff but uh we're spending this episode on the first script from 1993 that has james cameron's name on it might not even have had any contribution from him at all. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> but uh, we're covering a bit of the development beforehand since Cameron was not the first director attached. Uh, it was basically a whole host of different directors, some from low budget fare, like the late um, Albert Payune. I might be mispronouncing that. The guy who directed the first Captain America movie from 1990, who actually passed away recently, he was up for it. Uh, at one point and not uh, the first avenger but the first first one first first one yeah oh Matt yeah Salinger. yeah uh that people <laughs> people kind of list as like the forgotten era of marvel that they prefer to forget but yeah. that was kind of uh that they were going after those directors at one point before cameron um a lot of the info i have is actually from a book called spider-man confidential by edward gross that i got way back in 2002 when the first uh, Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movie was released. So I've had this book for 20 years, all to prepare for this episode. So this has been 20 years in the <laughs> Long making. time coming. Hey, is, <laughs> yeah. is Spider-Man your favorite Marvel person? Like I think is? he is. I know yeah. beforehand I was just like, eh, maybe, maybe. But now I'm like, you know what? Like, if I'm looking at how many Spider-Man books, TV shows, movies I've seen compared to other Marvel characters, he's he's probably my favorite i mean i've said daredevil but i'm like do i i don't have nearly as many daredevil comics part of it's it's harder to there's not as many adaptations anyway you've literally got the ben affleck movie and the uh the uh the tv show and i have not seen the incredible hulk where uh, he showed up but i'm gonna see that at some point oh that uh, one was back in the day 
yeah yeah we yeah. should check that out but yeah it, it there's not there's just not a lot of daredevil material as opposed to like spider-man you've got kind of he's the batman of the marvel in the sense that like he's their hottest commodity so there's multiple yes. animated shows all that stuff so i'd say he's probably he probably is mine really i'm sticking strong to x-men yeah i know <laughs> i can't ever give up my i'm a beautiful x-men so i know we'll get there i get it though i i mean i will say no way home is better than all the x-men movies probably <laughs> but but i still hold strong with them overall like oh, as yeah. a as a property solid, and solid. like days of future past was fucking sick i thought That's their piece, and, yeah. and first class mm -hmm. but uh but yeah no way home i mean yeah i, I can I totally see why he's like he's up there. Although I, at the time of this recording, apparently there's like no good Spider-Man run in the comics. Apparently, and, <laughs> I've heard about and, that too. And like half an X-Men run is good right now. Like out of it's the twenty that time. they have, yeah, it's kind of strange. But anyway, oh, I love Venom too. But that's another story. Anyway, represent great shirt. Yeah, great shirt. <laughs> For those seeing the video version, uh, my background's different because I'm recording somewhere else, and I did find this shirt today uh, in a drawer that I used to have. So I'm bringing this back. So a lot of this has been everything you see has been some time in the making, uh, deliberately or not. So let's go all the way back to 1985 <laughs> when they first started development of this movie. So, like Andrew said, no MCU at this time. No Maguire, Sony Spider-Man, no Batman 89 even. Superheroes are not a hot commodity. The closest we've gotten at this point in history have been a few Christopher Reeve Superman movies. This is a time so. when people would call you a dork for looking at a computer. <laughs> in the 80s. Just or looking at what one. it was. Just yes. knowing this is pre <laughs> you know, ma computer mouses didn't even come out to like the early 90s. There was like no mouse. Yeah. If you had a computer. This is a different time for different time yeah. for nerds at this point mm -hmm. for sure yeah so the studio that first gets the rights to adapt spider-man in a feature film is not sony or columbia it's canon films home of oh, yeah. low budget masterpieces such as death wish 2 missing in action missing in action 2 but also most notably for superhero fans superman 4 the quest for peace which ended the superman franchise and put it in a coma until superman returns so <laughs> we, not they didn't race. do the third one Canon i don't did think not they did do the third one. one yeah i don't think they did the third one i think they only did the fourth okay. one and we saw how that turned out well actually you and i have not seen that movie yet we'll, we'll i've we'll never seen superman, superman three or four and i'm, I'm not rushing Same to here. see them yeah that's <laughs> for those wondering where's the superman coverage we're not rushing to see three and four but uh, we'll cover two I, I have some stuff prepared for yeah. two coming into the new year but uh three and four i'm like i'm not in that much of a hurry for this uh but we'll get to it at some point uh canon paid marvel two hundred and twenty five thousand dollars at this time for uh plus percentage of percentage of gross revenue for uh adapting spider-man obviously it would have been way more later on uh canon then starts hiring writers to do the script and along the way they hire a duo uh, Ted Newsom and John Brancato. And I bring them up because they wrote the first draft of the script and it's a later draft of the same script that Cameron attaches his name on. So uh, the current draft we're going over today has five writers attached to it. <laughs> These okay. guys, Newsom and Brancato, a guy named Barry Cohen uh, brought in in 1986, Joseph Goldmari and James Cameron himself. Now, Let's imagine this. First draft is written in 1985. Cameron is attached in 1993. So this script is, it's got mileage <laughs> for a while from 85 right. to 93. Um, and there's like some other versions of the scripts in between. Uh, but in terms of information on how Cameron gets on board, at some point in the 90s, Canon decides they, they can't do this alone. They need another company. They pair up with Karolko, uh, I think that's how you pronounce it to produce Spider-Man and Karoko had basically worked with James Cameron on Terminator 2. So they're like, this is our guy. And of course, Canon is not going to turn down the guy who just did Terminator 2 <laughs> to do Spider-Man. So no one uh, would. That's that's exactly how he came on. But what's weird is I can't find a lot of information 
on why Cameron's name is on this script. Actually, according to one of our fans, Bob Garland, he said, quote, the Cameron film was going to use the Sandman and Electro as villains, which will be in the next uh, coverage uh, script that we're going to go over. He just threw his name on one of the drafts. So I don't really know how much contribution Cameron had on this. It has his name on it, but I, mean, I don't know if that's something somebody added. It, he was probably, tr again, this is my speculation as a jackass mm -hmm. on the internet, but he <laughs> had gotten some clout at that point, right? And he yeah. saw worth in this fledgling thing called Marvel mm -hmm. and was like, I'm going to put my name on this, not to steal the thunder from these writers probably, but to help it progress further in the Hollywood system to get it greenlit all the way and all that. You Let's know what get I mean? This done. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm, I'll sign my name to this in some way, be a producer or whatever it is, mm -hmm. put his, you know, slap his name on it. And then, you know, hopefully uh, it can see the light of day. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that could be it. I mean, again, the, the source of this is a script online and I don't know who necessarily wrote, like who wrote it in there. Like, I don't know if that was in the script itself or if somebody transcribes this and then just kind of threw it like eh, Cameron was attached at the time, I'll just throw his name on there too. Like it could be a whole number of different things. So cause... there's not much evidence to go on saying that he had much in, he didn't really get into the weeds of writing this one. He just puts this his name on one. It. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> might feel like false advertising guys, but I did definitely want to cover this one anyway, because it does have his name on it. People would be wondering why I didn't cover this one first. So we're going to cover comprehensive. It. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, it says the one online says draft one written by Barry Cohen and Ted Newsom and James Cameron draft two Joseph Goldmari, James Cameron and John Brancato. Now, this is already weird because uh, the duo that I talked about earlier, they were a writing duo, yet the credits in this draft have them split up across different drafts. So that's kind of lends my theory that maybe somebody messed up when writing this or transcribing this onto the Internet. But we're just going to go with it. Uh, it's dated July 29th, 1993. And let's jump into it. The Spider-Man movie of 1993. So we do not actually open with Peter Parker. We actually open with the villain of the piece, Dr. Otto Octavius. Now, it's been rumored for years that the plan was that it was going to be Doc Ock played by none other than Arnold which would have been cool and honestly a way better fit than Dr. Manhattan <laughs> to me. <laughs> yeah. What is this still from, by the way? <laughs> I got to ask Dan, actually. <laughs> this, this is not kindergarten cop or something. I don't think it's something kinder, else. For some reason. Yeah. That's the first thing that I thought I'm like kindergarten cop. No. Uh, so yeah, it's the us... dorkiest I've ever seen Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Dan picked a good one. <laughs> this one. And I guess if he was Dr. Manhattan, this would be him as John Osterman. But yeah, this is the thing. Funny thing is, I, I'll have to ask fans, send us anything official, either from Cameron or Arnold himself, if this was ever true, because I couldn't find anything. One of our fans, Jackson, uh, Jackson Putnam, brought up that uh, I believe the Arnold Doc Ock thing is entirely just fan made, though it would have actually been awesome to see under Cameron's direction. But let us know if we're wrong on that and if there's actually any quote out there from Arnold himself that he was almost Doc Ock. For visual stake, yeah. though, we're going to stick with Alfred Molina. Sorry, nerdy Arnold, but we're going to stick with Alfred Molina. Uh, so Was iconic he attached in the role... to this as well? No, I think this is oh. early. Um, okay, okay. I think this is still the... <laughs> this is still after Raiders of the Lost Ark, Alfred Molina. Okay. <laughs> this time, so I don't think he was big enough. Uh, but now so iconic in the role that even Kevin Feige was like, fuck it, we can't cast anyone better. Let's bring him back for No Way Home. <laughs> it's like J. Jonah Jameson. <laughs> and he would, they were right, though. I swear, I posted <laughs> I posted on a forum on Reddit online one time mm -hmm. years ago. I was like, what if J. Jonah Jameson just showed up in the MCU and, and Peter Parker walks into the office and then you see his back from the chair and he mm -hmm. swivels his chair around. He's like, what were you expecting somebody else? <laughs> you know, Simmons. <laughs> yeah. Something, something like that. Yeah. 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 Well, and they did it. We got. Yeah. 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 Uh, so awesome. Yeah. Arguably the best part of uh, far from home was that cameo in post credits. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Octavius in this version is a professor at empire state university conducting experiments on a device called a cyclotron 
And in the opening credits, he's already like mid experiment and alarms going off. And there's, you know, we're following the spider in the lab uh, as we explore the lab, which you can kind of like see from a visual perspective. That'd be kind of a cool opening credit scene right into the middle of the action. And in Octavius's laboratory is his assistant and his henchman, a hood he's hired to sort of circumvent the university administration. So Octavius is already kind of, uh, you know, shady at this point in this version. So he has this guy who he's hired who's a criminal. He's a secondary villain of the piece, and this guy's name is Wiener. Now, uh, <laughs> why? <laughs> Co- why? <laughs> it was co-writer Barry Cohen who gave us the Wiener for the script. And uh, he's actually a major, he's a major character in this. So Great. Expect a lot of wiener talk in this episode. Wonderful. So, the cyclotron is going haywire. I don't know. This is one of the things where I'm just like, I'm pretty sure Cameron might not have actually been attached to this. We got teenagers gooshing all over the place and goddamn <laughs> wieners in this fucking script. So, Doc Ock wants to basically set off the cyclotron. And like in the comic and in Spider-Man 2, he is, you know, already operating the tentacles. Uh, they're dubbed as Waldos in here, but they're tentacles. Uh, and uh, he's, you know, they haven't attached to him yet. He's just using them for his experiment with the cyclotron. And he says his villain catchphrase, okie dokie. I don't know where this comes <laughs> from. But... I think I think it's as dumb as Doc Ock, like, re- like words, sp- you know, mixed up, mixed around. That's what I'm getting. Like oh, make Doc God. Ock backwards or something. Like it's a bunch of O's uh, and K's and C's. And oh my God. Okay, maybe I didn't think about that. It's at all, just but... that dumb. It, you, you didn't think about it because it's not. It's it's so dumb. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure that's the only thing I can think of. Another thing where I'm like, eh, was Cameron really involved in this? So this is. I, it, it, again, I think it's just like Spider Man should be moved up the chain. Is what he's thinking. Yeah. This is this is a hot commodity. Let's. I'm going to help this out, even if it's in this fledgling stage (laughs) that it's in. We're not having a good start with Wiener and Okie Doke. It's got to be. (laughs) Fucking Okie Doke script, great. (laughs) Thank God we got what we got. But uh, yeah, yeah, this this Okie Doke shit is is all over the place in this uh, (laughs) this script. So this this is not the only time he says this. Um, But he says it as uh, the cyclotron is going off. And meanwhile, at the same time, we meet students at the university, including, of course, Peter Parker. By the now, way, that that image was from Sausage Party. Did you ever see that movie? <laughs> I didn't, but you're going to see a lot more of that. Oh, my God. Just real quick. If you guys haven't seen that out there, mm-hmm. it you know, sometimes it feels like the studio waters down a film. <laughs> Not in this case. Just a mild spoiler, but they have a fucking like orgy at yeah, the orgy. end. Yeah, I think. I about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's it's so fucking wild. Anyway, back to the Amazing. program. Uh, so what's interesting here is Peter Parker, before he's Spider Man, is a college senior as opposed to a high school sophomore when he becomes Spider Man. So they've aged up Spider Man a bit, which honestly could just be because of the fact that they find it unlikely they're going to find a teenage star. And this is still around the time where they were casting 30 year olds as teenagers. So they're like, we might as well make it a college guy. So it's not too ridiculous. I uh, know. So yeah. That's what yeah. makes that's that's my explanation for that. Uh, the other characters we meet are Spider-Man's love interest in this, not Mary Jane nor Gwen Stacy, but Liz Allen from the comics, who was kind of adapted into Spider-Man Homecoming until it was revealed that she was Liz Toomes, the, the Vulture's daughter. That twist okay. was the best part of that movie. But uh, yeah, she's Liz <laughs> Allen in this one. Uh, then we meet Harry Osborn, who is described as a nerdy kid. So very different from the movie versions that we got to see. Uh, and uh, he's Harry is almost like Ned in the MCU movies for this script because he's kind of the tech support for Peter. In oh, this. OK. Yeah. But there's like no like we never meet Norman Osborn in this. There's, so there's no Green Goblin for shadowing. He's literally okay. here to just help out Peter. So they set up thought, the next one. Yeah, potentially. So. Uh, Peter clearly has a crush on Liz, tries to ask her out, but she already seems to be going out with Flash Thompson. So that that classic dynamic is already established. That's in the comics. Uh, and as they're in sci- science class, the school's lights start exploding because of Doc Ock's experiment and everything shakes and a fire erupts. Liz is trapped. Peter tries to rescue her with a fire extinguisher, a fire extinguisher. 
but Flash takes it from him and douses the fire, and he, Flash is the one who saves the day. Son of a bitch. So uh, Professor Octavius arrives. The administration at the school is obviously furious about what happened, but Octavius doesn't seem to give a shit, and he explains what he's trying to do to the class, which is discover the anti-force, the opposite of force and gravity, as explained in this. And he's hoping that this will help him open the doorway to another dimension, a multiverse, if you will. Though that word is not used here, but that's what it seems like in the script. Um, and potentially bring on the end of the world, which seems to excite him. So this brings up an important point. The original writers, the Newsom and Brancato team, were apparently in conflict with Stan Lee over Doc Ock in the script. Stan Lee was like, make it true to the comics. This guy gets an experiment that gets tentacles to his body and he goes nuts. And they're just like, oh, <laughs> we need something better than that. <laughs> we need better motivation than that for the script. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then he goes crazy. <laughs> and I think, shooting webs everywhere. And he's a teenager. Man. Did I remember that, <laughs> mention that? <laughs> I think they kind of, I think the writers of Spider-Man 2 knew this. That's why they made it the whole like, oh, he's been taken over by the technology of the tentacles as opposed to he's genuinely crazy. But it seems right. like Newsom and, and Broncado's solution for this was that let's just make him nuts before he even has the accident. <laughs> let's just make him fucking that's crazy. Good. That's good. That's good. That's a, that's a good update. <laughs> it, it is funny, though, to me where I'm just like, eh, fuck it. We don't have to explain shit. He's already crazy. Let's just do it. Um, so after this class with Octavius, who's clearly screw loose, we get a bit of Peter's life in that he's already working at the Daily Bugle and he meets J. Jonah Jameson already. Jameson thinks that all of his photos are shit. They all suck. And uh, <laughs> he needs to come back. And Peter's just trying to, you know, make some ends meet. And he goes back home to find Aunt May, uh, who has let herself in. And the Aunt May in the script is interesting. She's kind of the precursor to the ultimate Spider-Man Aunt May or the Marisa Tomei version. Not in the sense that she's, you know, everybody is lusting after her, but more, <laughs> more in the sense that she's like the cool aunt who's more with it than Peter is in a way. Right. Uh, so she's not like the traditional grandmother type in the old comics or uh, the Rosemary Harris version in the Raimi movie. Like the, these writers apparently did not like the comic version of her always being like the sick grandmother type. And they're like, let's just make this a more fun dynamic. So okay. uh, you have an idea like she's basically tells him, I'm here to kidnap you for dinner in Forest Hills. And he's like, I don't know. I'm not sure. And she's like, what, you have a date? And he's like, no. And he's like, then come on. <laughs> so that's kind of her personality uh, in this. And Uncle Ben kind of has a little bit of that personality, too, where he wants to share a beer with his nephew. And Peter, of course, turns that down. So, oh, um, yeah. Cool and an uncle thing, which is kind of cool, kind of fun, especially with, you know, you know what's going to happen to Uncle Ben. Anyway. It makes their death more, you know, yeah, yeah, uh, more interesting if they're kind of cool at first. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I think I think that was a cool update for this one. Now, of course, in the Raimi version, we get a very traditional like grandparent type dynamic with them that stays true to the, the Ditko comics. But here I like the update. Uh, they discuss Peter's life and they encourage him to make Liz Allen his girlfriend, even though she's already going out with Flash. Uh, Peter can't stay long, though, because he's needed by Wiener, specifically <laughs> Octavius, uh, since Wiener is Octavius's assistant. So this kind of predates Spider-Man 2 in having Octavius be sort of a mentor to Peter, but their relationship is a lot less cordial. It's not as warm as in that movie. Here, Octavius is like, basically a crazy professor and Peter is kind of wary of him. And uh, apparently Peter has researched all this data in physics that he needs in order to get the cyclotron up and running. But Peter doesn't really want to give it to him. He's going to give it to Octavius's rival professor, who is an original character named Professor Rosenmorph. Uh, no Kurt Connors here or anything, but an original professor character who's kind of a, a mentor character to Peter. But uh, Octavius does not like the fact that Peter is not going to give him the data. He swears vengeance, dons the tentacles to continue his experiment, but ends up taking out his rage and frustration of being rejected by Peter on a spider he sees roaming the lab. <laughs> <laughs> and so okay. he gets, he's very unsuccessful in stopping the spider because uh, the spider gets on him and bites him on the neck. And in the process, the cyclotron that he's been trying to work with goes off. 
So we kind of get this. Uh, he, Octavius realizes what's happening and he says, It's an energy storm. Okie dokie. And then he gets caught. <laughs> this is terrible, dude. <laughs> terrible. Aren't we glad we got what we got? Yeah. So Oct Octavius gets caught in this after saying, Okie dokie. The tentacles fused to him. I don't know what happened to Wiener. He's hidden somewhere. Uh, but everyone around the university uh, finds out what's happened. There's been this big accident. And J. Jonah Jameson shows up and tells Peter, what are you doing around here? Get some pictures. So <laughs> he sends Peter into this radiated disaster zone <laughs> with the camera <laughs> as the paramedics are taking Octavius away. And as uh, he's like seeing what's happening, the spider who's been caught in this radiated explosion is still alive and ends up on his hand. And of course, bites him and now we finally get the origin at this point so nice doc ock's origin and peter parker's origin are tied in together which makes a lot of sense in in this context when you're trying to introduce both people they kind of did some version of that with uh, the raimi film where you know they kind of become their characters on the same day uh but peter gets bitten by the spider feels dizzy but makes it back outside to jameson who pays him very cheaply of course for the pictures that he's taken and as the ambulance containing octavius runs by peter jumps out of the way and ends up sticking to a wall discovering that he can attach himself to it like a spider so now he starts jumping around the buildings trying to test out his new powers um there's not really like a coma type of period that he gets into like uh Toby Maguire and, and Andrew Garfield got into. He kind of just immediately has these powers right after getting bit, which is close to what we got in the original comic. Um, but this guy who claims to be a talent agent sees him, you know, basically climbing around the buildings and says, I can put you on TV. So Peter's excited for that. He tries to tell his aunt and uncle what happened, but they're not really sure what he's talking about. They think he's talking about Liz. So he's like, I got bitten by a bug. And they're like, you mean a love bug? And it's like, no, I was in the bathroom. And, and May's like, you did it in the bathroom. Peter, why didn't you use your bed? So his aunt and uncle don't really buy what he's saying and tell him to get rest. Honestly, the best stuff is Aunt May and Uncle Ben at this point. So uh, in Octavius, Octavius, in the meantime, is getting operated on. And the doctors note that his mental activity is actually 10 times that of a normal man. They don't really do much with that information in the script, but I thought that was cool. Um, they pretty much stabilize him here. There's no horror scene like in Spider-Man 2 where they're operating on him and the tentacles come alive. I thought I, I thought almost for sure that was going to happen when reading this, but it didn't. So uh, Octavius is in the hospital. He gets a visit from the school administrator and learns that the university has shut down his experiment given what just happened. But of course, he's incensed by that and he feels like he needs to in order to enter a new dimension he must first destroy the current dimension that we're in and end the universe as we know it as i said they decided he was crazy already so uh he uh he uses his tentacles to grab his boss's throat who tells him to put him down Oct doc doc Oc slams him up through the ceiling killing him and says okie dokie of course and then lets him go so more okie dokies in this at this point. Uh, so Doc Ock has killed his boss. And now Peter goes to meet the talent scout who sort of noticed them climbing the buildings. And he brings them to, of course, a wrestling match. And the guy gives Peter a box and tells him to put it on. And inside the box is the classic Spider-Man suit. Nice. I kind of like this. Uh, but uh, Max tells him to don the mask. It'll create a mystery. No one should know who you are. And uh, the announcer says, coming up is the incredible Superman. And the, and the guy is like, no, no, it's Spider-Man. Call and say it's Spider-Man. So right. they're trying to do a Superman reference in this. Uh, but uh, Spider-Man does go up against the wrestler Crusher Cole, which sounds very close to Crusher Creel, uh, who's the absorbing man. But Crusher pins down Spider-Man, who throws him off, but doesn't realize his own strength at this point and ends up throwing the guy into the crowd. Peter wins the money. Uh, that uh, he was promised with commission to the guy who gave him the Spider-Man suit, of course. So uh, the whole wrestling thing is set up. However, unlike the Raimi movie, it does not lead directly into Uncle Ben's death because that was something that uh, they did to streamline the origin in that okay. movie. So uh, Spider-Man is just now known as this famous wrestler on TV, kind of like in the early Amazing Fantasy story. 
So uh, at the same time, Doc Ock has broken out of the hospital and returns to his lab, determined to rebuild the cyclotron to something bigger, better, hotter. So this is similar to the scene in Spider-Man 2, actually, where he's sort of monologuing to himself about how he's going to rebuild everything. And then, of course, his buddy Wiener arrives and brings <laughs> up that he saw that uh, this new wrestler named Spider-Man uh, has shown up on TV and he was distracted by that. But Ock still pushes Wiener to get him the Parker data that will help him complete his work, even if he has to steal it. Otherwise, he will beat Wiener off. So <laughs> Wiener tries to look for Peter, but finds Spider-Man, who intimidates him and puts him high up on a building. Big thanks to Dan for photoshopping this. Uh, nice. image. You guys got to see this video just to see what Dan did. <laughs> nice Photoshop work. So we have, let me explain this for yes. the uh, for, for the aural listener. Uh, we have a sausage party guy in a hood. <laughs> <laughs> Literally the sausage party guy. <laughs> what's Spider-Man doing at the bottom here? <laughs> oh, I think the context is from Homecoming where he webs up the bicycle thief and then he's oh, holding yeah. up the bicycle asking whose bike it is. So okay, okay. It, it does look like he's about to beat him with the bicycle. Yeah, in this it photo. looks kind of wild, but it's funny. <laughs> good job, good job, Dan. So yeah, Spider Man's going to beat Wiener with a bicycle, but in, in this one, it's it's uh, Peter is uh, intimidating Wiener and um, tells him like, "Don't come here around, like, don't come around here trying to harass Peter Parker." Uh, and the professor Octavius, who you work for, he can't have the data and stuff. So he's trying to scare Wiener off and he drops him off and uh, sends Wiener back home. Meanwhile, S sends his Wiener back in. Sends his Wiener back home, yeah. <laughs> Doc Hawk goes to an actual electronics factory with tentacles and all <laughs> because he needs to get supplies to build the cyclotron. And the guy who works at the store <laughs> is like, well, if you want all this, it's going to be $475,000. Doc Ock's like, uh, I'll be back. Cut to Doc Ock robbing an armored truck so he can steal the money bags to pay <laughs> this guy I love the that store. these were, in this movie, they were, and, and the one that we did get, they were like, just a, they look like they could be in DuckTales or something. Like these, these money bags. <laughs> they needed so, the dollar sign. So cart yeah, they needed the dollar sign. It's just about the only thing missing from it, right? Yeah, I was hoping that I, I told Dan, like, put the money bags in it so we can comment on it. But I, I forgot they don't actually have the dollar signs on them. I know. In my memory, I thought I thought they did have it. I guess they don't. But everything else looks like a, like a cartoon. It is. Yeah. So that's it's great. But it is hilarious to me that it does seem like this was a little bit influential on Spider-Man 2. The script It's just they took all the good stuff. Right. They, knew what they, doing, finally. they took out Wiener yeah. entirely. <laughs> so, yeah. Wiener was hidden. So Dong Ock <laughs> robs these money bags just so he can pay for parts to rebuild his machine. With, and I love that the script, because that happens in both the script and Spider-Man 2, but I love that they actually show him at the store with not enough money and he has to steal it. <laughs> Even yeah. though like, you would think, why wouldn't he just steal the parts? At that point? That's true. That's true. <laughs> but... Uh, Anyways, Peter hears about what's going on from Jameson because Jameson doesn't want any photos of Spider-Man for once. He actually wants photos of this guy with four mechanical arms who just robbed an armored truck. And Peter realizes he must be talking about Octavius, you know, his crazy professor with the tentacles who was caught in that accident. Uh, it then cuts to Halloween time where uh, even though Wiener wants to dress up in a costume, Doc Ock threatens him that he cannot go out for trick-or-treating unless he gets Peter Parker's data. Okay. Or so kill him. Uh, Peter, in the meantime, is at the school costume party uh, with Flash Thompson actually dressed up as Spider-Man. We get that whole dynamic where like Flash is a big Spider-Man fan, even though he hates Peter. That type uh, right. of thing that carried right. over into, uh, you know, the the new Flash Thompson. And there's a costume contest, a costume contest. And when the winner is announced, the winner is Spider-Man, the real Spider-Man. Peter shows up and gives quote the greatest dance number in film history. My so, God, they had this fucking shit planned. <laughs> we have this some Spider-Man Spider 3 foreshadowing here. <laughs> God damn it, man. I fucking hated this scene. I was in the theater like everybody else. Just like, what is going on, dude? I don't know why they had this plan for so long. I, I don't know either, but I, I will say like the, the dance stuff, it, it is fucking ridiculous in Spider-Man 3. It is only 10 minutes of the movie. And if they did cut that out, 
I think the movie would have like it would have been seen in a better light because we the rest of the lost pretty... much. Yeah, <laughs> I know. We would have gained. Yes, quite a lot. Uh, so after this big dance sequence, uh, Liz <laughs> Allen asks who Spider Man no, is. There's just no fucking reason for this shit. <laughs> This it drives me crazy, that kind of shit, man. I will, I will say, at least in this context, right, it is like it's a party. So it kind of makes sense that there's a dance off as opposed to Toby just dancing when he gets out of a store. He's evil emo dancing. <laughs> I, I like, dude, do something else more evil. This is just lame. Yeah. So uh, Liz asks, who are you? This great dancer. And Spidey tells her one day she'll know. And it's, it's kind of like the... Um, it's kind of similar to the Raimi movie because he ends up telling her, I'm your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man and it takes off. So mm. that so kind of carried definitely over using this script. Yeah. Uh, for some of the Raimi stuff, uh, so, <laughs> including Spider-Man three, the dancing. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, definitely some things got carried over here later. Spider-Man takes a cab and tells the cabbie that he has this tingling feeling that his aunt and uncle are in danger. So we get a little bit of the spider sense here. Um, and they're in danger because Wiener has arrived at May and Ben's house to steal the data. And uh, Ben catches Wiener and tries to get his gun to nail Wiener. But uh, Spider-Man arrives too late because there's a gunshot. And you guessed it. Uncle Ben gets killed. Death by Wiener in this. So Dude, you can't name the guy that kills Uncle Ben Wiener. There's <laughs> a name in the comics, too. It's not Wiener. What is his name in the comics? It's Carradine. <laughs> Carradine. It's Dennis Carradine. Did he Which... fucking kill himself? By fucking... <laughs> no, it's <laughs> different. Mind. That's that's a dark. <laughs> that's that joke's too dark even for me. I'm gonna with. Please forgive me. <laughs> Certain <laughs> people in the audience know what you're talking about. I'm gonna step me. around that one actually. <laughs> but yes, this I, is... I, ta I take that one back. Speaking Internet, of Wiener, I take that back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Can we keep this in? <laughs> I'll leave that up to you. You do the editing. <laughs> that's a, that's a good one. <laughs> oh anyway, man! Please on... forgive us, dude. We're going to hell for sure, man. Oh, Lord forgive us. Uh, we're halfway through the script. Wiener has killed Uncle Ben, and now Spider Man's going to actually start becoming a superhero. And I think on that note, onto the break. Just wanted to announce that I have a new podcast called Gaming Gaiden. It's about Japanese to English translation. In this first season, it will be 10 episodes each season. If you saw the ranking, every Superman video game two-parter we did here on Superhero Stuff You Should Know, you have seen Mike before. So yes, if you like video games, if you've been interested in Japanese ever, we're going to be talking a lot about just Japan in general. Japanese cultural differences as well and we also are going to have a lot of talk about 90s video game magazines such as Electronic Gaming Monthly aka EGM so stay tuned for Gaming Gaiden Podcast it's already out now y'all it is true that we all lick our own dicks every once in a while <laughs> <clears throat> All right, and we're back. Uncle Ben has been killed by Wiener. Let's see what happens. Uh, they Can't take wait. Uncle Ben. <laughs> they take Uncle Ben to the hospital. Peter and Aunt May find out that, of course, his uncle has died from his wounds, but not before revealing that the intruder in the house was looking after, looking for something in Peter's computer. So that gives Peter a clue on who it is. A detective reveals that they have chased Wiener to a warehouse. So Spider-Man knows where to go to bring his father's killer to justice. So Spider-Man tracks down Wiener at the warehouse. Thank you, what Dan, for another fuck? amazing Photoshop. <laughs> this, this is good. God, I know this is a podcast, but most, please most look at the my, visual version. Most of our pe listeners are on YouTube these days, but like, for the oral people, because um, you guys have been with us the longest also, the, it is fucking a sausage party sausage. <laughs> Almost like breaking into the uncanny valley. It's so strange with the with the realistic like noir lighting and like he's wearing like what a beanie. He's wearing the beanie because it's it's him photoshopped. It's the sausage guy photoshopped over the actual killer character from the two thousand two Spider Man movie. Right, right, right. Yeah. 
Also, this if you have Spotify, we now have this on visual too. That's so true. You can check this out. Uh, good, good plug, Ben. Natural yeah. plug. Yes, <laughs> uh, we're putting the video on Spotify uh, as of the, the the episode, but just before this one, especially this one. Yeah, <laughs> of these visuals, we need. Yeah, them, so. yeah, yeah. Uh, credit to Dan, did, like, dude, like Dan showed me the visuals for this episode just this morning, and I got to this one. I'm like, <laughs> one note. <laughs> Could we do? Because this was originally the still from the movie until I remembered yeah. who kills Uncle Ben in this. And so uh, Dan <laughs> provided accordingly, and we now have this greatness. I'm Dan probably going to put provide. this on our Instagram or something at some point. Oh, <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, Spider-Man tracks down Wiener. Wiener tries to shoot. <laughs> Wiener shoots at Spider-Man, uh, who knocks him into a net, which gives Spidey the idea for, you know, web shooters and stuff. And uh, he captures Wiener. Now... <laughs> <laughs> this is a joke that keeps on giving man it just really does we miss i gotta say we miss a major beat in the origin here because spider-man based off of uncle ben's clue already knows that wiener is the killer of his uncle and there's no moment where he tracks down the killer and realizes oh it's the guy who i let free earlier there's no oh i just learned with great power comes great responsibility Oh yeah, they all. fucked up on that one. In this, like, the, there's there's barely a mourning period for Uncle Ben. There's no like, oh, I should take responsibility in this. It's just kind of like, hey, yeah, his uncle dies, and then he's got to face off against Doc Ock. And I'm like, really, you don't have any. This is why this was not made. I think because did you, you you're think missing the major component? Did you think that the Amazing Spider-Man had a better death of Uncle Ben segment? I kind of felt like that was strong in the movie. Maybe it was just really? dark, dark at all. Mm. I feel, I feel like I'm not trying to take a hot take here, but <laughs> maybe it just, just is. But at least for the Uncle Ben death stuff with the mm -hmm. voicemail message and all that, I felt the Uncle Ben stuff was a bit stronger. And the scenes where he's kind of, you know, he's kind of yelling at Aunt May and stuff are kind of more powerful in some way. It felt way more dramatic. It is a more dramatic, uh, like, <clears throat> in both the Raimi movie and The Amazing Spider-Man, you've got Peter basically in a fight with Uncle Ben before the death happens and stuff. And yeah. I think it's it's a lot more elevated in the Garfield one, you know? So, like, yeah. Yeah. I, I'd agree with that. I think the voicemail uh, is really touching at the end of that one. But I think the actual, the death itself, I would, I still prefer the Raimi one simply because it's just, it's it's more traditional. You know, it's pretty much it's more traditional, but also streamlined in a way that makes sense, because in the comic, it's, you know, one night he lets the guy go. And then like a couple nights later, then the guy breaks and just so happens to break into the house and kill his uncle. And then Spider-Man finds the warehouse like in, in this one, right. it's streamlined where it's like the guy literally was getting away and carjacked Uncle Ben on the way out. So okay. it already makes sense. So I'm like, it kind of improved over the comics in a way um, because you don't have that coincidence that he just happened to break in. This guy went from like robbing kind of a public place to just robbing homes at the same time. You know, it made more sense in the Raimi one. And then I don't know. I thought it was weird in the Garfield one that they kind of did the Joe chill thing where he's like his, you know, his uncle's killer was never found. I'm like, let's, there's there's some weirdly Batman esque elements oh, in that dude, amazing Spider Man movie. Those movies were coming out at like kind of the height of Nolan popularity. And yeah, I'm sure it was reboot. pitched like let's make Nolan's. What if Nolan made Spider Man? And yeah, I you know I get that the fan base doesn't like that, and it, he I I, I don't want to return to that either. Mm -hmm. But I gotta say the first Garfield I kind of liked. The second one with Electro, Jamie Foxx trying really hard, but it's just... <laughs> he was more redeemed in No Way Home. It's not the actor's fault, generally. It's just no. that movie wasn't that good. And like as mm -hmm. a whole, I felt like... But the first one with the lizard, I thought was like not bad. I don't... It was one of those times where it's like... I didn't know why the internet was shitting on it so, so hard. You know? Yeah, I think they were just, it was fatigue of the gritty reboot thing. Cause like, even like I revisited all of them before No Way Home. Yeah. And like, we get to that one and I'm like, okay, it's trying so hard to be Nolan Batman as Spider Man when that's just not the character. You know, like, I, I know, that, but that's, I that's was, why it was shot on, I think. I was ready to 
uh, experiment with that. I guess I was I was well, okay with that being at least one thing we try. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah, I think that it's it was worth doing, but you can see that there's sort of a somewhat of a course correction, partially because like the first the first movie is about him going from like this vengeful darker character to becoming a little bit more traditional Spider Man at the end. And then yeah. the second one is a little bit, is weirdly both lighter, but also kind of darker at the same time. Amazing uh, Spider-Man 2? Yeah, while also yeah. being just a, a lot more of a mess story-wise. But I think oh, yeah. when Zach was on with us, he he brought up how he actually prefers the second one just for the characterization of, of Peter being better. And when I revisited those movies, I'm like, you know what? I feel like he has a point. I think the first one has a better story. Because the second one is just a mess because they're trying to build up way too much stuff. But yeah. I think Peter, like Garfield's a better Peter Spider-Man in the second one. So that's kind of my take on on the Garfield stuff. Uh, I guess so. I I, I didn't I, I did watch the Spider-Man cartoon a little bit, but mm-hmm. like it wasn't like my main thing. It was always, as everybody knows, it was X-Men as far as mm-hmm. Marvel stuff is concerned. Mm-hmm. And so I guess I did go into the Amazing Spider-Man. I was just, I think it was kind of made for me at that time. Like I was ready for a darker Nolan Spider-Man. I'm not saying I wanted to go back there. I don't want Tom mm-hmm. Holland to be doing that. But mm-hmm. at the time, I was really okay with it because I just didn't like like Zach and everybody else were. They were just so um, invested in the character in 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 his traditional sense, the traditional yeah. Spider-Man. So. <clears throat> And I, I just wasn't really at that time. I think I was also trying to do a course correction because of the reputation of the Spider-Man three dances that they're just like, let's go dark and serious in this one. There are no always dances over, <laughs> always overcorrecting. <laughs> there's way overcorrected. <laughs> way overcorrecting. There's, there's a there's a big gap between dance numbers and Spider-Man going all Batman. It's <laughs> other big, than big right. Gap. Other other than like actually commenting on this episode and not this tangent but if you're going to comment on the tangent i would like to know as a guy that i don't probably don't know as much about spider-man as everybody else does watching this i mean i know i've seen all the movies i've read some comics but still probably a noob compared to a lot of people what are the exact scenes you can comment below that show spider-man not the characterization being bad in amazing spider-man one where exactly do they go wrong? Mm-hmm. What lines, what actions does he take? Because to me, I'm an idiot. I, I, need to, I need to be told straight up, I think, in this case. Guys, this is really our excuse to just have Dan's amazing Photoshop of Wiener uh, on screen for even longer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move on with the, with the actual, with the actual no, program. Definitely leave the comment on there because that, yeah. that could be a whole other episode, honestly, that we could, that we could Characterizations. Go yes, uh, yes, yes. Characterizations and stuff, yeah. But uh, anyway, <clears throat> Peter finds his uncle's killer. It's Wiener and uh, comes home and at home. Uh, this, this is Peter. It's Wiener. <laughs> Have I said it enough? <laughs> Here he is again. For those who need to see him, um, why is this not coming up? Oh yeah, and so pretty much uh, he. Oh yeah, before he comes home, he encounters the police who he provides the killer, but they want to arrest him too because he's a vigilante and stuff, and he gets pissed because he basically did their job for them, which is similar to like we were talking about the Garfield movie. So, nice. hey. That was actually uh, related to what we were talking about. Anyway, so uh, going further, Peter comes home and Liz is there and wants to uh, sort of visit him and go over stuff from school. And she seems to be liking him now. And Peter goes down to see if he can hail them a taxi so they can go out. But as he goes down, Liz gets visited by Dr. Dr. Octopus. So she's freaked out by his tentacles and he brings (laughs) up that he's the real Spider-Man. So he's not even calling himself Dr. Octopus. He's calling himself the real Spider-Man in this one. Because he's like, I got eight limbs. What does that guy have? <laughs> Nothing. Yeah. Just gooshes webs left and right. Yes. He's probably a teenager. So here are my tentacles on your chin, he says. So uh, Liz <laughs> fights back by distracting Oc. What's putting... wrong with us this episode? <laughs> <laughs> we are rated explicit. <laughs> <For> those <laughs> who That's true. Complain. Every time we upload, we, I do have to click not made for kids <laughs> on YouTube. We probably have a lot more fucking 
<laughs> listens and views if we fucking just didn't swear so goddamn much. <laughs> when you got a script of Wiener, I mean, come on. Yeah, I know. That's true. Liz uh, fights back against the tentacles uh, by distracting Auk, and actually she shoves his tentacles into a socket to electrocute him uh, before running off and yelling for help. So Auk chases after her. Peter sees what's happening and changes into Spider-Man to help, where Doc Auk chases Liz into an abandoned construction building where Spider-Man has his first confrontation with Dr. Octopus, or the real Spider-Man, as he's calling himself now. He's getting confusing. <laughs> Guess what? I'm you! <laughs> so, he wants Peter Parker's DACA. Sorry, DACA. That's the villain in the Batman serial. He wants Peter Parker's data, and he holds Liz up above. And Liz tries to fight back, but her blouse rips and she falls. We have the classic, you know, the girlfriend falls from a great height and Spider-Man has to catch her. Um, so he does catch her. He saves her. And he ends up in this big fight with Octavius, who has such award winning lines like, now I must kill you, you cretinous clown. So. Who, who says that again? Doc Ock. So, <laughs> Does it say okie dokie next? He says okie dokie. I kill you now. So, oh my god, dude. Uh, Spider-Man baits Octavius into going after him, tricking him into falling into an alley where a bunch of cops are and letting Octavius have to deal with that as he rescues Liz. Uh, and he takes Liz web-slinging, which she absolutely hates. Again, foreshadowing uh, MJ's reaction in Far From Home when he took her web slinging and stuff so uh, I thought that was kind of a nice little uh, gem there in the script but uh, pretty much they have a nice tender moment Spider-Man and Liz Liz is the only one who calls him by his nickname Spidey in the script and he likes that okay um, but he but also brings not up... going to do Tiger because that's Mary Jane that's Mary Jane yeah <clears throat> so uh, sh he brings up but you have a boyfriend and she says well Flash isn't exactly her boyfriend and you know, there is someone else she likes, but he's just too shy to really do anything about it. And at that moment, of course, of course, Flash Thompson shows up since they're at Flash's place. And Liz is already finding it suspicious that Spider-Man knows where Flash Thompson lives. So she's yeah. already sort of suspecting that Spider-Man is Peter. Uh, Spidey goes back home to, you know, Peter Parker's apartment, only to find that his place has been ransacked with a note left by Octavius, who has stolen his data. So Octavius puts Peter's data through the computer and finds that it's the missing component that will help his experiment and ultimately bring about the destruction of this dimension because he's a fucking lunatic in the script. <laughs> so He's going to try to destroy the multiverse, ultimately? <laughs> I think he's trying to destroy this dimension so he can go into another dimension. <laughs> to destroy that one as well. <laughs> go to another dimension where I'm written better. So he goes to... <laughs> The okie, goes, it's the okie dokie dimension. <laughs> <laughs> the phrase okie dokie is cool. So, <laughs> I'll be cool in this next one. So, yes, that's, uh, <laughs> that's for sure. Peter, Peter goes to Harry Osborne for help. Again, I, I was telling you, Harry's kind of the tech support in this movie, like Ned in the MCU movies. Does, does uh, Spider-Man have like a tech support dude in the comics? Not really. So it's kind of right? weird that like... It's kind of weird that Hollywood is like, let's just make his best friend who has this goblin future, uh, you know, a tech support friend. It's one of those things where, like, if you had, you know, a dollar for every time that happened, you'd only have two dollars. But it's weird that it happened twice. It's kind of <laughs> like what happened here. So, I mean, it's not bad because you set up the drama that they're friends. They're close <clears throat> yeah. to each other. We probably know each other's secrets. Mm hmm gooshed a couple times together <laughs> but uh, but um, it's not in the script <laughs> uh, it's a subtext <laughs> subtext yeah, of all the wiener and tentacles they teach yeah. you that in college <laughs> yeah, all the su this is a very subtle script it has a lot of beating of wieners and tentacles in this so <laughs> and web fluids so. fucking jesus why is this such a ridiculous <laughs> script who wrote this? Cameron. <laughs> Cameron. This is why I'm like, maybe Cameron didn't do this one. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's, he saw it. He's like, we got to elevate this. <laughs> this is not right. I'm thinking of going in a different direction. <laughs> yeah. First thing, <laughs> find and replace Wiener. <laughs> replace it with Dr. Vagina. <laughs> God, that'll be better. <laughs> Representation, everybody. <laughs> I'm woke. Sarah Connor. <laughs> Peter, Peter and Harry determined that the data from this data that 
Doc Ock is going to use the subway system to get enough power for his experiment. And lo and behold, uh, he does. So the chaos just, the, the chaos erupts in the subway with trains flying into buildings and shit. So Spider-Man goes to rescue people. He ends up, just by coincidence, rescuing his professor, Rosamorph, Doc's rival, who has not really been in the script until now, except for a few scenes in the beginning. Easter and Rosamorph now becomes a major character in this third act. So, <laughs> um, Let's hit another pass, man, this whole Ros- script. <laughs> Rosamorph tells them that Ock will need plutonium to pull off this experiment. And Spidey's like, where will we get it? And the guy's like, at the dock, uh, sorry, at the toxic dump. So Spidey has to go locate Ock at the dump. Not at like a NASA-like facility. It's at a fucking dump. <laughs> it's at a fucking toxic dump in There's Jersey. Fu- <laughs> fucking, you can make a goddamn uh, nuclear <laughs> bomb with that fucking shit. You need a, you can't, can't be a dump. I don't know. It's it's NASA this person is at the dump. Fucking Area 51 or some shit like that. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you at this point. <laughs> I didn't write this. So, Doc Ock carjacks a Corvette. And Spider-Man goes after him and just so happens to run into Flash Thompson and Liz on the road. So, Spidey lands on the convertible and has Flash chase after Ock, who's going to Jersey for the toxic waste. Ouch, if you live in Jersey. So, uh, we have a car chase. <laughs> But uh, Flash gets stuck in traffic. Spidey completes the chase by web slinging over to the dump where Spidey fights Auk again and even manages to snap off one of his tentacles. Ouch. But Auk throws Spider-Man down a well full of toxic waste and Spider-Man catches himself, but he's out of web fluid. He has shot all of his wads at this point, so he cannot get any further up here. (laughs) So You start shooting blanks after a while. Yeah, (laughs) seriously. Obviously. Um, Flash and Liz arrive along with uh, the professor dude. The professor is like, you know, I'll help you and you can have these other students help you too. So this professor shows up and saves the day to help rescue Spider-Man at this point. Okay. Uh, a, lo- a big role for a guy who's not in the comics and has not really been in much of the script beforehand. Um, yeah. Spider-Man calls Harry for help as Liz and Flash escape from Auk, which is pretty easy somehow. So, uh, they all sort of try to hack into Doc Ock's network to stop what he's about to do, but they need Peter Parker's genius in order to do it, and they're not smart enough, apparently. So uh, Ock turns on the cyclotron. Another universe, uh, another earthquake happens at the university, like in the beginning. Spider-Man arrives with the professor, but they're too late to stop Ock as he launches everything. The world's about to head towards destruction. The anti-force is here as Empire State University flies up into the sky. <laughs> so, okay, this is an AI image that Dan rendered for us of a flying Jeez. building. Yeah. <laughs> so, man, concept concept artists and all that, like, yeah, it's gotten like a lot easier for them now. But also, the competition with fucking robots now is yeah. ridiculous. <clears throat> I don't know. We just we just did for this one uh, on that, but no, it's fine for... for us. It's fine, but for <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was like Dan. Not... <laughs> I was like Dan. I need a picture of a, a building flying into the clouds. He's like, you mean like looking up at a building in the clouds? I'm like, no, I need a flying building. <laughs> That's awesome, though. It's a cool image. It's amazing how good AI art is. It's so crazy. Yeah, it is, but still, <clears throat> support your local artists. But support also, them. this is crazy. I, I think I kind of agree that it shouldn't be at Artist Alley and all that and comic conventions. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, let it be its own sort of fun thing without it infringing on anything artist-wise. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so inside this flying university, uh, Spider-Man and the Professor go toe-to-toe with Ox. The Professor is basically Spider-Man's sidekick in this third act here. Uh, he succeeds in using... Not Spider-Man, but the professor succeeds in chopping off another one of Ox's tentacles with a fire axe. But Ox, Ox sends him through the floor, falling to his death from the university. So there goes that professor. Rest in peace. Uh, R.I.P. So Spider-Man fights Doc Ock. Uh, Liz appears and she says, the building is flying, which is a little bit foreshadowing of what Hawkeye says in Age of Ultron when Sokovia is, is floating up. Oh, man, uh, I saw that no, I saw it twice in the theater, but I don't remember much about it, too. It's a birth of vision, right? That's about it. Yeah, but there's also the part where Hawkeye's like, okay, so the city is flying. It's flying right okay. now, and I got a bow and arrow. And I'm like, this dude, is basically how he talks Wanda into being an Avenger. I don't um, remember that at all, dude. I think it's one of the better scenes. Uh, is it? In that one. Yeah. yeah. 
yeah. uh, especially for her arc. But it, yeah, it also yeah. gives Hawkeye something else to do besides shoot bow and arrows. <laughs> Don't belittle <laughs> yourself, man. Uh, so Liz and Spider-Man work together get together to sort of cut the Cyclotron's power. Doc Ock isn't convinced that he's finished, though, and he sees the dimension of light, the multiverse, the universe where okie dokie is a cool catchphrase, and he decides to go into that, and he ends up disappearing. And so that's the end of Doc Ock. But because of this, Spidey and, tra- yeah, Spidey and Liz are trapped in a falling building, so Spidey uses his webbing to help break their fall, and he changes into Peter and helps her out of there, uh, and they sort of float down into Central Park for the rest of the script, which is kind of nice. Liz hints that she knows that Peter and Spider-Man are one and the same. And so they kiss saying that this is the end of a beautiful friendship. And that is the end of the Spider-Man script. What did you and, think? End of a beautiful friendship. And as the if they used to be friends, but now they're going to be lovers. I think. <clears throat> yeah, that's cool. I like that. Um, I mean, as we've been talking, uh, <laughs> it needed another pass to find yeah. and replace Wiener entirely. <laughs> um, that guy sure that probably shows would have up. been Weiner or something in the actual. No, like, movie. that's still ridiculous. <laughs> I know, I know. <clears throat> it's too much. And then um, <laughs> that guy that shows up, that a prof- rival professor needs to have more of a third, a first act presence. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not the worst thing in the world, though. You know, I feel like we've probably covered worse here on this channel. We have, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and they obviously took all the good stuff for the other ones, so. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, it was it was good overall. Um, in this one, he has the canisters, or it's part of his body. The web. Yeah, he has the canisters in this one. Okay, I remember that was what that's what Cameron wanted to do, right, with his script. I guess that'll be the next episode. We'll see you in the next one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because I remember people talking about that. I think was the it being part of his body a McFarlane thing. The what part of his body? Like the not needing a canister, just shooting out like McGuire does. Um, I think it was Cameron's idea. Um, uh, Ca- Cameron wanted canisters, though, right? No, Cameron wanted Cameron actually did want organic web shooters, oh, as we'll see oh. in the next one, like McGuire. Like, yeah, what, what like what uh, McGuire ends up happening. There's, there's a, okay. actually a lot of DNA from Cameron's next thing that lands into the, the Raimi Spider Man, so okay, uh. We'll cover it when we get there. But yeah, well, I mean, dude, the uh, origin of this is all messed up because like there's no I mean, you don't necessarily need to have the literal words with great power comes great responsibility. But if you're just going to remove the entire beat of like, oh, my God, I let that guy go and he killed my uncle. Right. Like I don't know what we're doing here. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> you totally <laughs> remove the soul of the whole thing. <laughs> Yeah, this is I basically understand. now just an action movie of him fighting his messed up professor. <laughs> like, this is... it's, it's sometimes it feels like they surgically remove the best parts. Yeah, I know of of like nerd properties. They do it much less than they used to. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, yeah, I mean, well, anyway, yeah, this script is fine. Thank God it we was, got what was we fun. got. How yeah. were when you, I know you couldn't go into detail in this episode, but how were the action scenes? Did they read well, or did it kind of feel like you had to really like fill in the gaps with your imagination? I mean, they read okay. It's just it would have been interesting to see in 1993 because you've <laughs> got right. it, like you got Auk and Spider Man like climbing up and down the buildings and fighting each other, and like it's in 2004, like they had the CG technology to do that. But 93, I'm like, yeah, Terminator had come out, but I, you don't necessarily know. And again, Terminator looks age-wise has looked great in terms of the effects but uh i don't don't know what that would look like so it it would have been it would have been a challenge it's interesting it's it's kind of you read it and from like a 2022 lens it's like okay i I could i could see that happening but then it almost becomes more interesting when you envision like oh this is 1993 what would this look like so the action kind of like the fucking flying building like in 90 like these days there's always a miniature yeah, like there's always like a portal in the sky and, and CG type stuff, and you're just like, okay, more of the same. But in like '93, that was that would have just been that would would have been insane to see. Everything, on everything was practical, pretty mm-hmm. much. I mean, I, yeah. I guess the T1000 did exist and all that, but yeah, it would have mm-hmm. been probably mostly practical. All the the tentacles and everything, all that yeah, movement stop that motion. would have been. Yeah, the movement of that 
<clears throat> without CG. Oh my god, dude! I can't even imagine how they would have done that because you had yeah. to suspend the actor and then also move the tentacles in real time. Yeah, um, prosthetics. Not, yeah, layered it's insane. with. Yeah, like basically what I what I read because the these script these screenwriters the the Newsom Brancato team talked a lot about like here's how you could pull this off and for Doc Ock they were thinking put the actor in prosthetics layered with a fully extended miniature like miniature thing of the arms that are like stop motion or something I'm like that's that sounds like hell in order to actually do production with it but <laughs> it would be insane yes yeah that's that's what they had in mind at the time and of course remember this is this is canon films mm -hmm. right is, they had a budget. people with a ton of money yeah so this would have been on a budget so i don't know what this would have looked like they did uh, he-man right canon uh, he -Man. i don't know i'll have to take a did. look um but yeah i mainly know them because of this and superman 4 quest for peace but uh, yeah, this is this is one out of many scripts during this time. There's an earlier draft actually of this that we can cover another time. Um, but I don't. Wiener's not in that one because that was. Oh, they had to add Cohen it to this. One. Added Cohen added the Wiener to the script, uh, but that was not in the original one. But yeah, there's a whole history. Mr. Eli Mack, uh, one of our fans here, said, "Quote from the development in the early '80s, where Stan Lee himself wrote a draft for producer Roger Corman in Orion Pictures, to the draft that had Spider-Man be a werewolf-esque creature with Menahem Golan and Yoren Globus at Canon Films, to the draft by Ted Newsom and John Brancato with Doc Ock as the villain, to the rights going to Coroco Pictures with James Cameron potentially rewriting that draft." potentially noticeably is in quotes because I, I think Mr. Eli Mack is also unsure how much Cameron had a role in this one we talked about mm -hmm. to James Cameron's script treatment with Electro and Sandman. I've researched this history too much and would love to hear your thoughts on the history. Well, Mr. Eli Mack, again, it took us a long time, but we finally got here to at least one of them and uh, we'll be going over the James Cameron scriptment with Electro Sandman organic web shooters. We'll be going after, we'll be going over that actually in a couple weeks because we've got our Christmas special first coming up. Woo! Hinting. Yeah. Hence, hence, yes. hence. Yes. And with that, that is superhero stuff you should know. <laughs> Big thanks to our MVP of this episode, Dan, for the visuals, especially of Wiener in this. It Ooh, really made the episode. <laughs> so uh, let's go over to the fan comments. Eric Johnson commented on our episode with Bobby 80s on the unmade Batman cartoon saying you guys mentioned the Zorro part of the origin was added for Dark Knight Returns but there's something else this this episode the fear introduced and then Frank Miller solidified in the Dark Knight Returns and year one as canon which is that Alfred knew and was implied to have raised Bruce when he was a child that is a 100% accepted normal part of the Batman mythos now and everything from Burton to Nolan to Reeves but remember Alfred was originally a bumbling actor slash detective who stumbled into the Batcave, uh, saw Bruce and Dick without their masks on, and stayed on as Butler because he knew their identities. Pen Peanut agrees. Uh, <laughs> yes, this, he does. This, uh, this episode before Frank Miller is the first place ever to suggest that Alfred was around before Dick Grayson and was more than likely a father figure to Bruce growing up. This is a good point, Eric. We also brought this up in the Unmade Origins of Batman um, cinematic origins of Batman episode. So check out that episode if you haven't already, but it seems like it might've even predated that episode of the fear in the scripts that were written before that time in the development of the movie, you know, even, <clears throat> yeah, it might've been something from Michael Uslan. We might have to ask, uh, Uslan that if we ever bring him back. Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> so <laughs> Eric brings up that uh, in reference to the fact that I brought up like, hey, doesn't Robin already know Batman's origin in this uh, this episode of The Fear? Uh, Eric says that is super awkward in the final episode, but it is bizarrely clarified at the end of the scene that, of course, Dick knows parent Bruce's parents died. He didn't he just didn't realize it was that alley or make the connection. And he says, I never realized that was the same place. So <laughs> that makes sense. Thank you, Eric, for clarifying that. Thank you. On to Sparkageddon. Thank you, Sparkageddon. Two years later, this is still my favorite deep dive on y'all channel. And he's refer he's referencing Unlimited What, the uh, Batman Returns script deep dive. Oh, he uh, he was just watched that one. That's cool. He rewatched it. Oh, rewatched it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so oh, thank man. you, Sparkageddon. Yeah, that's a, a classic at this point. Yes. Uh, fun fact: Ben 
the Batman 2 script first draft Raven statue idea from Sam Hamm came from Adam West Batman 60s show in episode 19, The Perfect Crime, in episode 20, Better Luck Next Time, where Catwoman steals two golden cat statues and finds a map which leads the treasure to a cave where she falls off a cliff to her death, the same way Sam Hamm did with Penguin, and that's why she's more villainous because of the 60s show. Yes, uh, that's that's actually something uh, that's a really good point, Spark get, and especially because Ham confirmed to us that he was a big fan of the 60s show. He was kind of the opposite of Daniel Waters and, yes. and kind of just knowing that it would be, a, the, you know, an influence on him. So right. thank you that, for that. Uh, and then Evan, Evan Zarimba uh, says, Happy Thanksgiving, Ben and Andrew. You guys are awesome. Can you interview Harold Belker about his time on Batman and Robin? Just asking. And then Oliver Emeralds below says, The Batmobile designer. It would be cool. Another one they should get should be Ron Mendel, who designed gadgets for the movie. There are some really awesome concepts of how they transformed the grappling gun into the gauntlet launcher. Uh, these would be good gets. These would be good gets. Uh, we'll see what we can do. But Put it out into the universe. Indeed. We'll, we'll see. We'll ask uh, you know some of our concept artist contacts uh, about if they know these people. So uh, we'll see. But yeah, plenty of stuff to come in the year to come. But with that, I think over to the fan shout outs. Oh, man, it gets me every time. Hopefully <laughs> I have this page ready. Holy crap. There's been technical difficulties. Been Sorry, here we long. go. Oh, it's we been go. too long, too. Yeah, <laughs> it's also true. All right. So thank everybody for up on the board here. You can see it in the visuals. Um, some of our uh, more recent people are thank you to uh, Yusuf A, Kevin R, Derek O, Mark M, Renee V, and Braxton W. And our other supporters as well. Thank you, as always, everybody. Uh, it's been a while since we said something to Kooky Noms. Thank you, Kooky Noms, one of our longest uh, people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so uh, please join us at the one dollar tier uh, at patreon.com slash superhero stuff pod. That, that'll get you that there shout out, and then uh, and on the board as well. And then the five dollar tier gets you the whole other show. Um, you've been saying a lot of parts of a lot of these. Uh, That's true. Yeah. Released recently, so you get a taste mm -hmm. of what it's like. Uh, still trying not to release episodes of that, but <laughs> but yeah. So uh, it's a whole other show, and it's every Friday. This show's every Monday, and uh, check it out. And um, yep, then we have the ten dollar tier, which is the monthly meetup, and you can meet up with us monthly, where we have a topic to discuss, and it's like a Zoom like call and and all that kind of jazz. Uh, we have some kind of merch over at uh, Redbubble, uh, superhousepod.redbubble.com, and some other something or other at uh, superhousestuff.threadless.com. <laughs> Big thanks to Alex from What Mean Podcast for getting some of the merch. Yes. Uh, uh, we're still working on maybe uh, updating our art here. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so anyway, artwork by Stefan Santa Cruz. And uh, please send us your audio. Uh, and thanks, Alex, by the way. Uh, sorry, I glossed over that. Uh, but anyway, um, <clears throat> send us your audio to superhousepodcast at gmail.com. Uh, you know, any kind of audio bumper would be great. And then I'm Thunderwolf Drew on Instagram. Thunderwolf Drew on Instagram and Twitter. Thunderwolf lives on YouTube. Thunderwolfdrew.com has my whole portfolio, except for amonorecon.com. And... That is basically Power Rangers meet Strangers, y'all. Um, it's not a Power Rangers fan film, but that's like a quick elevator pitch uh, to get the idea across as to what it is. Um, it's uh, on Indiegogo right now. We are trying to fund a bigger, uh, a whole episode for this show. Uh, we want to have a series, but we're, this first Indiegogo campaign is to get funds for the first episode for the series. And there's a pitch video on there. You can see uh, what we're going for. Um, think of, again, think of like X-Files, a little bit of Men in Black too, actually. Um, Stranger Things, things like that. But Power Rangers as well. So um, mm -hmm. artwork by Zachary Jackson Brown, art com. Awesome poster there. And uh, the Indiegogo campaign is on AminoRecon.com, linked there. Um, that's a m a n o r e c o n dot com. Gaming Gaiden is my other podcast. Um, it's we're about to close out our ten episode season um, soon. I think episode nine of ten releases the day this comes out. But uh, 
we interview a lot of Japanese to English video game translators in this season. So check it out. Ben. Shout out to Comic Capital on Instagram, as well as the Everything Entertainment Club on Clubhouse. Follow us on social media on Twitter at Superhouse Pod, Instagram, Superhero Stuff Pod, TikTok, Superhero Stuff Pod, Vero, Superhero Stuff Pod. My website is benwanwriter.com, where you can read a whole bunch of scripts, Gotham Vampire, where Bruce faces off against the Mad Monk, or Elementary, The Death of Sherlock Holmes, or Curb Your Enthusiasm, Disneyland, the Curb episode they could never make, where Larry David goes to Disneyland. My YouTube channel is in the description below, where you can also check out Doctor Who, The Ronin of Time, The Eighth Doctor Meets Miyamoto Musashi. You can check out my personal Instagram, at Ben Juan Ryder, or my son's Instagram, my cat, Alfie, at Alfie Pennyworth Cat. And if you have an Alfie yourself or Peanut, who made a special cameo uh, in the last few minutes of this episode, then you can get the Whisker Box, the only cat box with the crazy cat lady and gent. And if you don't have a cat, that's okay. If you have a dog, you can get the Bark Box, y'all. Get your dog exactly what they want. First month off free, valued at $35 with our promo link. And that is available at Superhero Stuff Pod dot com slash shop and if you don't want to shop for anything that's cool too you can visit superhero stuff pod dot com slash show notes where you can find the show notes to the episodes if you guys are curious about some of these scripts and want to read them for yourself and they're available online we will provide the link for these scripts if they're available and if they're not available then too bad we can't forward these over to you guys some of these <laughs> are giving it to us in secret i'm sorry but we can't we can't give these all out to people but this one that we went over today is available online we will have the link in the show notes and you can check out other stuff that i wrote in there check that out superhero stuff pod.com slash show notes and i think that Yay. is it and we'd like the uh Caradine estate to do us a favor and forgive us uh but, yes. uh, but and, also, the <laughs> and also the rest of you we'd like you to do us a favor we want you to tell all your friends about us <laughs> Weird. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>